Uh, so today I'm going to try to demonstrate some of the elements of good presentations, give some kind of key tips uh, for how to both design and also actually give your presentation. Um, this is not going to be fully, you know, everything that we've ever sort of learned about how to give good presentations. I'm going to have some additional links for you to follow along uh, for other guides, including guides that come from journals such as Nature, um, where they've done a lot of work in looking at different kinds of presentations and seeing what are sort of the key elements. So you're going to see some of that here, um, but I'm going to particularly kind of focus on what I see often as the, the areas that, um, you know, presentations, whether they're research presentations or student class presentations that can be improved more frequently, but also very easy to improve when you're actually setting up your slides. Um, and I should just say, you know, one of the things that you'll see is my style for slides is pretty simple. I tend to have a fairly clean and white background presentation. You know, you've seen that many times. Um, you can have your own different style guys. But one of the things that we'll talk about is it's important to make sure that you are minimizing the noise, visual noise on your slides. And that includes both text and extra images. So you can really focus on what's the key points of your presentation. And to that end, the key point for this presentation is that scientific presentations uh, should be brief, they should be focused, and they should be targeted to your specific audience. Uh, and this is an element that we're gonna see a little bit later on that it's always very important that whenever you're giving a presentation, that there's definitely a clear outcome that's supposed to be, and we start with that outcome because it kind of frames the whole presentation about what is this talk about. So in this case, it talks about scientific presentations, and this is kind of the kind of guiding uh, piece of evidence or piece of guidance I would give you when you're thinking about how you're gonna design and give your presentation to really focus on what is the audience looking for and give something that's, again, brief focus and very specifically targeted to that group. And that's why we talked about a little bit earlier today in the Elasi group to think about what is the actual audience for your presentation. So I'm going to start with an outline of this workshop. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the key questions to ask when you're developing your presentation. We're going to look at tips on how to design your presentation to be as effective as possible. Um, and I should say I was very fast in making this. So in fact, there's some places where you could even critique the design of this, and that might be a good uh, metacognition thing to, to play. Um, some tips on how to present your presentation. And then we're going to actually take that information and go and evaluate some uh, talks that are actually posted up online. We're just going to look at the slides for those, but we're going to give a chance to kind of put this theory into practice and see how other people have made their presentations and what are some of the aspects of these key tips that they may have done well and things that they may have missed as they did it. All right, and then we'll end with some of the key takeaways. So let's start with just these first three questions. Um, and these are the things that I really think about whenever I'm starting to design a presentation, um, because I get presentations in all different kinds of contexts. Sometimes it's a research presentation to my scientific peers. Sometimes it's a class, like I'm giving a talk in my class. And then sometimes it's a public presentation, right, to a general, general audience. And who your audience is, is extremely important. That's the first question you should think about in terms of designing what you're going to talk about. And of course, this gets into the fact of knowing what is the expert level of your audience, right? Are they astronomers? Do they know the, you know, the terms and the jargon words that are present in astronomy? In which case you don't have to define them. Or if it's a very general audience, then you wanna avoid those jargony terms and try to stick with plain language as much as possible. Um, and the other thing is thinking about what the audience want to get out of this presentation and Conversely, what's your goal, right? So when I'm giving this talk, what am I trying, what's my goal for giving this talk in the first place? So you might be giving a talk for a class where you need to present your work and show that you learned, you know, something about, I don't know, fitting data, or you got this result in your laboratory experiment, or you're presenting your research paper for your class. Each of those has a very specific goal to demonstrate your mastery of the material so you can get the best grade you can. On the other hand, I might be giving a talk so that I can get a job, right? And this is very frequent in academia when you're getting a, when you're trying to get a job, maybe as a postdoctoral scholar, even as a graduate student or as a faculty member, you might be asked to talk about your research. In that case, the goal is to get hired <laughs> or to get money, right? And you really wanna then emphasize your work, your contributions, the value of what you've been doing as a scientist. 
So it's always good to know what is the goal of the presentation. And I think, you know, so for example, for the Masi talks this Friday, the goal is to communicate what you've done over the last eight weeks um, in a very short way, right? Only 10 minutes. And so that really steers it to emphasizing the practice and the results that you've gotten, right? What you actually did. So describing those methods is clearly something that's gonna be a goal of that presentation. So who's your audience? What's your goal? And then finally, what are one or two main conclusions that you want your audience to walk away with? Um, in many of our research practices, we might have a whole a slew of results. So for example, I am thinking of, uh, Dino just published a paper last week, very long paper, oh, I think of something like 100 pages. And he has many things that he's discovered in his research. And there's something like seven or eight main points. And that's great. If you want to read the paper, you can read through and, and find those main points. But when he's talking about his results, he really needs to shrink that down to one or two key takeaways that you absolutely want the audience to walk away with. Um, so again, thinking about when I'm thinking about his paper, he might choose like the first two, or he might choose the one new result that's brand new compared to everything else. Or he might choose to highlight something that's surprising, that maybe counters the existing ideas in our community. So it's very important to think about what are the most important parts that you wanna take away from your audience to take away from your presentation and really make sure to hit those very clearly right at the start and right at the end. All right, any questions on like these three questions? Yes, I have a question. Yeah. What are the only one goal of the presentation or can be two? I mean, it's possible you have multiple goals for your presentation, but again, you wanna be very careful to keep it simple, right? So um, I'm trying to think of an example where you might have multiple goals. Do you, do you have an idea, Adriana, where you might have multiple goals? Well, yeah. The, the one goal is, of course, to give the, to, 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 okay. <laughs> to communicate what we have done on this summer <laughs> on the GCS research. But in my case, I will, I will, I will wish to add to uh, show what are GCSDs doing uh, between uh, the, the unit what between UCSD and what is said, that is my case, with the intention to invite to invite for the people that is interesting. Why I am saying this? Because uh, usually um, the engineering doesn't think in astronomy as a, something that can follow. And there are many, many such a very interesting things in engineering that that does need to know physics or a deep uh, study in some science, uh, pure science. So my intention would be a hey, look at this area. It's so interesting, as so technical. Um, uh, it's like a how I say reto? Ah, <laughs> challenge. So a great challenge to the engineering that we are uh, forming on these uh, times that are very, very interesting and so many things to know. But so that's why I am asking. Yeah. And, no, so yeah, so you so you're thinking, you know, you have kind of like one idea is so we want to you know communicate to the Amasi community what we've done. That might be a main goal. And then another goal for you would be you want to communicate to folks in engineering how you know there's a lot of interesting things that are not just you know not focused on just like specific engineering things, but have application to a broader range of astronomy and physics and stuff like that. Is that do I have kind of that idea right? Yes, yes, that's yeah. right. Because so, the, the people doesn't think that the engineers can go up this area. Well, I don't know, I don't know, but. So this is where this, this kind of intersection between who's your audience and what your goal is really important. So when we think about the Amasi Symposium, um, it's not just engineers, 
right? There's a wide range of folks who are going to be attending this. And so the goal that you define is a very good goal, but it might be a goal better suited for an audience that's primarily engineers, maybe primarily engineering students or maybe engineering peers, right? That is really a goal that's specifically targeted to that population. Um, and so, for example, you might in, you know, the next month or something like that, you know, want to share what you did this summer with a group of engineers. In that case, then you might take the same presentation and transform it or maybe add a slide or whatever you want to do to modify it so that you really emphasize that point about the intersection between engineering and basic sciences. So that's so so and that's the great thing is that you can have the same presentation and make very small modifications and then it becomes very relevant to other groups. So you do want to start with who's your audience and then based on the audience, what are your goals for that audience? Okay. Let me, yeah, so let me do another example. So the UCSD fellowship folks are going to be talking, or we think are supposed to make a video for the donors, right? These are the people who have actually given money to the university in order that the students can actually, you know, have a living for the summer doing research, right? That's a, that's a great thing. And so they, I think the purpose of the donor videos is to communicate to the donors that their money is being put to good use, right? So in that sense, it's still important to show that, you know, you've done, you know, you've, you've made these discoveries, you've done this work, but there's another side to it of, you know, and this has been very valuable to me as a student, right? The fact that I've been able to be supported this summer has allowed me to do this research and to learn about astronomy and to build toward my career goals. And so in that presentation, you might wanna have a slide that kind of talks about the personal impact on the research, which you wouldn't necessarily put in for the Amasi presentation because you know, that's, that audience is necessarily looking for that. Whereas the donors wanna know that, you know, I gave all this money, is this actually being put to good use? And you can say both in terms of science, but also personally, it's been a important application. So now we have like a new slide we put in because we're thinking about our audience. Okay. You know, the other thing is that the donors may be more scientifically, you know, literate, maybe more professional engineers or something like that. So you can probably use higher level language in your presentation than you initially would for a general public talk. And I think we talked a little bit about that earlier uh, with Adriana about that language. So again, your language, what is the purpose of the goal? All of these are factored into your audience. Okay, so let's get a little exercise with this. So I do have a, uh, the next slide here is actually a interactive thing. We're gonna do a quick Jamboard here. And what I'd like you to do is to go to the following Jamboard and I'll put it in the chat link. Um, and if we turn to that Jamboard, um, there are three, these three questions. What are the, oops, I go back. Who is my audience? What is my goal? And what are the key points I wanna convey? So for your, your presentation, so for in Lasse, that's to the Lasse Symposium. For the UCSD Fellowship students, that's for the donors. For everyone else, imagine a future undergraduate research conference that you're giving. Try to answer for yourself, what do you think these three main, the answers for these three questions are? So let's give a couple of minutes to do that. Okay, so let's get, I'm gonna read through these. And again, I, we have about, uh, looks like we've got, about 13 of you and not as many sticky notes. So if you're not participating in the sticky notes, please make sure you're doing this. This is the active part of the presentation. So uh, don't just sit back and take this passively. Um, let's go through a few of these. I'm gonna go back to the um, uh, audience here. So, um, you know, we heard uh, some uh, repeats of some of the things we talked about you know, for the Masi group. Yep, it's the Masi students, some professors, um, the general public. Um, we could also have students who are interested in this topic. That's an interesting case, you know, particularly if we're, even if we're looking at um, a group that's different scientific fields, astronomy is just one of those fields that people just kind of, you know, like, because for whatever reason, look it up at the stars. So that might be interested in terms of thinking that there may be people interested in this topic and they might be more understanding of some of the concepts. Um, certainly if you're giving a talk with other experts in the field, which might be the case for the donors, 
um, then that will gauge uh, whether you're at a higher level of, of a scientific background. And you have someone who's there, someone who has a, some amount of scientific background. Um, yeah, so it's a very important to really, you know, to the level of what are the ages, what are the school levels of my audience, what do they know about my topic. This is something you really should identify first before you start to go in and design your, your presentation. Um, in terms of question, what is my goal? Okay, we've got quite a few here. Um, so uh, we've got one person says it's you know what that we did you know what we did this summer and why electrical dwarfs are super cool. Pun intended, I'm sure. Um, inform the audience. So you know again, you want to think about inform the audience of what is it about the science? Is it about the methodologies that you apply? You want to be very specific about what is the goal. Um, now, if it's the sense that, you know, I want to inform the audience that we actually accomplished something because, for example, they paid for it, then that is a very specific goal. But you want to kind of tune it to, we want to show that we accomplished a scientific outcome or we accomplished finishing a technical part of the project. That will, again, depend a little bit on your audience. Um, yeah, how I contribute to the project might be a good example if you're giving a talk where maybe you're being um, evaluated for a scholarship, then you really do want to emphasize your uh, contributions because they're evaluating uh, what you did. Um, in the case of like the Inlossi program, that's really more of what did we do as a group because we're all a part of the Inlossi program. So all of these are good uh, sets of goals, but you definitely want to be very specific about what do I specifically want to get out of this um, or what do we as a team want to get out of this. Um, and that's, I think you've, you've touched a, good, a few good of those. And then key points. All right, so we've got actually quite a few of these. This is great. Um, and some of them are, are very long and detailed, which is very nice. Uh, so we've got a few here about communicating the ideas of, oops, sorry, I twisted you around there. Communicating the ideas of um, machine learning. There's a couple of those, you know, the advantage of these. This is definitely a good example because, you know, I think in this, spread of community, the Spinelli group, the sort of wide range of students that are out there, I would bet you many of them have heard of machine learning, even if they're not in astronomy and physics. So that might be a good point of connection with who the audience is and what you want to convey, because more people may understand, or at least have heard of the words or phrase machine learning, and therefore will have some understanding of it, as opposed to ultra cool dwarfs, which probably nobody has heard of outside of this group. Um, <clears throat> you know, and then uh, there's, so there's a few more machine learnings. Um, inform that, there's a couple here that inform that stars could have Earth-sized planets out of the solar system. Now that's an interesting one because that is certainly one of the reasons we think ultra cool dwarfs are interesting. Now you have to think about if that's your goal, is what we're presenting actually gonna be realized for that goal? So we're not actually proving that any of these ultra cool dwarfs have Earth-sized planets. Um, that is an interesting question, but if what we're doing doesn't actually achieve that goal, actually demonstrate that goal, then you may want to rethink the goal, right? So it may be that ultra cool dwarfs are cool because they have Earth-sized planets, and we want to demonstrate that we can find a lot of the systems that we want to search for these Earth-sized planets, but we're not actually going to discover Earth-sized planets from our presentation. So your goals should be consistent with what you've actually done or what you can actually show, uh, even if it's a more, even you have a more aspirational goal of kind of learning about precise planets. Okay. <clears throat> and then, you know, the other thing that's important is making sure your goals are very specific. So why examining ultra cool dwarfs is relevant. Um, that again is kind of part of the introduction, but what about ultra cool dwarfs is relevant? Relevant to whom? Right, so you don't want to have a vague statement here. Your goal should be very clear, concise, and something that you can actually demonstrate as a result of your presentation. All right, any questions on, on those? And again, this is something that as a, as a scientist, I do every time I'm preparing to give a presentation. So, um, you know, I have uh, coming up in next month, I'm going to be giving a presentation to the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. So I'm already thinking about my audience is going to be professional scientists 
who know a lot of the sort of jargon around you know scientific aspects but not necessarily around brown dwarfs so i know i'm going to have to go and define some of those terms and motivate the reason to do some of this work but then i know i can bring in planetary science stuff and they will get that and that will be a hook for them to get interested in so i'm already starting to think about that and also my goals are to excite this group in the kind of research i do and so it means i want to make sure that i'm bringing in the planetary aspects of my work as opposed to say the stellar aspects right so all of that is part of the planning process any questions on that not yet <clears throat> not yet okay all right all right so let's now talk a little bit about designing effective presentations and um, I will say that I'm going to go through just a few of the key tips, but there's a bunch more that are at the end. And by the way, this is one of these uh, key tips for your presentation is you want to think a little bit about what you want to specifically focus on because you can't talk about everything. The Enlossi group knows this to a great degree because they know they have way more information to present than they can possibly do so. So one of the goals is to think clearly about what is important. And if there's other stuff that you want to present at the end, you can always add in additional slides for Q&A or for reference afterwards. So as I'll show a little bit, there's actually a, a last slide in my presentation that gives a lot more of these tips, but I'm going to focus on just these so I can have a presentation that sits within our, within our time period. So first point here is start with your key takeaways at the beginning and at the end of your presentation. And in fact, you saw that. Right. My very first slide after my title slide was this scientific presentations should be brief, focused and targeted to your specific audience. This is my main point for this presentation. Now, there's a lot of other ways that I talk about in terms of getting to this point, but this is the thing that I want everyone to take away from this presentation to think about the audience and to make sure that it's you know brief and clear and focused. And so I'm going to lead with that in my presentation. And as you'll see later, I'm going to end with it so I can remind folks that this is the key takeaway. And at most, you should have one or two, right? And I mentioned that before. If you have a long list of key takeaways, it's very hard for the audience to know what's the most important. And they're not necessarily going to remember more than one or two points anyways from your talk. So you really want to make sure you focus it down to what is the most important or most concise learning outcome or goal for my presentation and make sure to state that clearly out front okay um next statement is organize your presentation now obviously when you're planning to make your presentation you know for the mossy group we've already made a couple outlines for both the paper and the presentation but you can also include that outline as a guiding sort of structure for your presentation overall and in fact, my third slide in the presentation was an outline. We go back there, right? There was my third slide. It starts with an outline. Let me show you another example of this. Um, this is a talk that I gave with Chris Thiessen uh, earlier this term on um, uh, how to get academic careers. And the first thing we had, looks very familiar, is an overview, an outline of what we're going to talk about so that the audience knows ahead of time that these are the key points, right? In addition, during the talk, in the upper right corner, I had those same five points reproduced up here with the section that we're on kind of highlighted here in blue. So not only is there a, you know, a, an advance, here's what you should prepare to learn, but to allow the audience to kind of keep following and see what's coming up, I have that outline repeated in other slides. So, this is just one tactic. There's many ways to do this. You can also like insert, uh, we're on to the next section, right? A slide that's kind of a subtitle slide like that. Um, but uh, providing the viewer with some structure about how this talk is going to go and how to follow it, again, will make it easier for them to follow the talk and understand kind of where you are, and what the point is, right? Particularly for long talks. So for, you know, the 10 minute talks that the Amasi group is doing on Friday, you probably don't need this because it's going to be over before you start. Um, but if you're giving like a, a full talk, you know, often when we give science talks, those are 50 minute talks, five zero. 
And, you know, if you talk for 50 minutes, the person listening is probably going to get lost after 10 minutes or something like that. So it's good to have this kind of structure to kind of keep the audience member engaged and kind of where we are during this talk and where we're going. Okay. So again, outline, of course, is good for planning, but you can also have an outline integrated into your talk so that your viewers can keep track of it. All right. Now, part of that outline, part of that structure is to provide a clear logic flow. And the main way that we do this is something called the story arc. Now, if you've ever read any story, right, any short story, any novel, um, there's kind of a structure to most of these stories, right? It starts with an exposition, which is kind of a, you know, this is kind of where we are, this is kind of the introduction, this is kind of the setting for our story. There's some rising action, some tension that kind of gets you pulled into the story. There's a climax, a point where, you know, the action is at its peak. You know, if you're reading like a action adventure story, this is, you know, Indiana Jones, like trying to, you know, discover their treasure and finding it, but having like the Germans fight them, right? There's this action point where you're kind of in the midst of the most climatic part of the story. And it never ends there, right? There's gotta be kind of a wrap up. So, you, you know, if you ever see a, a movie or a book that just ends at the climatic point, that would be completely disruptive because you're like, well, what happened? I need to know the results, right? Did they win? Did they get away? So you need to have a falling action you know, kind of what happens as a result of that climax. And then finally, kind of a resolution, right? You know, this is the kind of happily ever after, but maybe it's a little more detailed than that. So you see this kind of structure in all kinds of stories. And telling stories is something that we as humans have, you know, through our social connections, just evolved to do very well. We remember things through stories. We're able to communicate clearly with stories. And people want to hear stories. So if you can set up your presentation like a story with these elements, you're going to find that that's something that folks will, will really follow through to the end because it has a sort of natural narrative or story arc to it. Now, how does that work for a presentation, scientific presentation? Well, we can think about what are these elements correspond to in terms of the scientific aspects of our study. So for example, the exposition or the introduction could be presenting the context of the work, right? So just like the opening of a story, you know, is gonna to have to tell you where we are, what's the physical location, what, what year is it, who are the characters, right? You're providing the context for the story. Similarly, when you're giving a talk, you wanna provide a context for the research. There's all kinds of different astronomical research out there. So you wanna make sure you focus it down to, this is the area that we're interested in studying, ultra cool dwarfs, right? And then we also kind of want to set up the reason that we have a story, which is kind of the conflict, right? The problem. What is the unknown thing that we're trying to solve? What is the, you know, challenge in science that we're trying to address? And we talked a little bit about this in Masi, for example, you know, we're looking for ways that we can find new ultra cool dwarfs in large data sets. That's kind of the problem. That's the conflict that we're setting up so that we can rise into the actual work that we've done. And that's kind of the rising action, right? It is literally the actions that we've been taking, the methodologies we've been following. How have we gone about to solve this problem? So again, for the Inlasi folks, that would be the machine learning methods, right? We've decided to try out this particular approach, these random forests, to see if it will solve our problem. And here's how we did it, right? So you can see that we're building up the action to what we've actually done to address the problem. And of course the climax is, well, what came out of that, right? What was the result of doing that work, right? And you know, it's better if it's climactic as in like we discovered this amazing thing, but at least it's gotta have some kind of result, right? What did we learn from this process? What came out of that? So again, for the random forest, that might be the outcome of the training, the discovery that we could be 98% accurate. That's a great climatic result, right? Um, for the, so let's say the, the white dwarf binary team, it could be that, you know, we've discovered, you know, that there's these seven M dwarfs that haven't been this, that really studied in any way, but they'd be really good uh, age uh, uh, metrics. So we've got this like really exciting new samples to look at. So this really should be kind of the, 
you know, this is the high point. We've done the work and now we've got some results. That's the peak of the action. And just like a story, you don't want to stop there. Right? If you just say, we got these results, the end, right? You're going to leave the reader hanging, or in this case, the viewer of your presentation hanging. So you need to bring the action back down and kind of talk about what are sort of the implications of this work. So if I discovered, you know, let's say that um, in my random forest, I discovered that I could be 98% accurate to separate out ultra dwarfs from non ultra dwarfs based on photometry, right? Well, so what? Like, what do we take with that? Well, that's when we can start to talk about, well, we have applied it to, you know, this data set, that means we would find this many ultra dwarfs. And maybe we even try that. So a couple of you, you know, you guys are also, you know, trying to discover new brown dwarfs for these, you know, you can show how you've applied it. And then the implications that you could find a lot more as a result of this process. And that leads us to the resolution that we've applied this, pro this approach to solve this problem. We've kind of seen how that unfolds in the rising action or the falling action. And now it's kind of looking ahead, right? So, you know, heavily, happily ever after is just not interesting enough for scientific presentation, right? We wanna talk about what are the implications of our research, right? Maybe this means that we no longer have to invest time in getting spectroscopy because we know we're gonna get all the information we need just from the photometry. Or it may be that actually it turns out that we're only maybe 50% good at getting ultra cool dwarfs. And so that means that we will need to invest in some ways of getting spectra in order to do the analysis, right? So this is really kind of looking ahead at, you know, what are the implications result, but also, you know, no study is perfect and no study is complete. And so it might be thinking about ways that what can we do next? So again, drawing on the uh, random forest work, Maybe it's thinking about what other information we can fold into the training that will improve our results. Um, you know, so, you know, for example, for the team eight, you're using spectral fluxes. Maybe this is commenting on if we add more colors or we add other information such as proper motion, that would be a next step to see if that would make our results better. So this is kind of like wrapping things up, but also looking ahead to, of course, the sequel, <laughs> book number two, uh, where you go on further. All right, so that's kind of the narrative arc. Any comments or questions on that? Big X from Morocco. Okay, so again, these elements that we're talking about are good for any kind of presentation, whether it is a scientific presentation or it's a class presentation, or even you're telling a story to your buddies, right? Like you wanna make sure that you figure out how to build into this narrative arc as you're telling that, that tale. All right, next step is minimizing text in the slides. And one would look at this slide and say, hey, wait a second, uh, aren't you already violating this with these slides? But one of the ways you can do this is to minimize the text that we see in the slides. Notice that most of this is grayed out but in fact, the key points are very clear. We've got our title, which states very clearly what the point of the slide is, that there are these key tips for designing an effective presentation, and then the one tip that I'm focusing on. So there are different ways that you can reduce the amount of text, but also keep the flow. And by the way, this is also kind of an outline as well, right? I'm using that line structure here and focusing on the main thing. And the only two lines of text that are there are the two things that we care about, what section we're on and what specific topic we're looking at. But more often in the case, it's something like this. So this is actually a slide from one of my own presentations. And um, you'll see these kind of slides very often. And you know, the key thing is that if you look at this, there is one interesting figure, right? And I can spend some time talking about what that is. But there's also all of these words. And in fact, some of them are words that seem like just gobbledygook, right? There's a bunch of numbers and extracted from this random set of numbers and all these things, and I would have to spend a lot of time explaining what this is, and at the same time going through all of these main points that I described here. So if I actually went through all of the information on the slide, it would take probably two or three minutes. And meanwhile, you're not actually listening to me because you see some words on the screen and the impulse is to read them, right? You see some words, you gotta read them. So while you're reading, probably this entire time I've been talking, 
you've only been kind of half listening or not listening to me at all. So when you have this much text on the screen, the text becomes a distractor. It makes forces people to read over you. And even worse, if I were to sit here and just read through this text, JBL DDT time awarded, but there's a QSO with 0.8 uh, Janskis at 1.4 gigahertz, you're kind of following me, but you might be reading faster or slower. And so there's actually a cognitive dissonance between what you're hearing from me and what you're reading on the screen. And again, that's gonna force you, that's gonna cause you to get lost. Um, I'm sure all of you have had a teacher who has a slide that has a bunch of words and they just read the words on the slide. <laughs> I do this sometimes myself. And the fact of the matter is it's just very hard to follow that because your reading and my reading are at different speeds. And you're gonna have some conflict with that, particularly when you have a mixed audience. So better than having all these words here, again, thinking about what are the key points and reducing the slide down to just the key points and try to minimize the amount of text. So here's the original, here's a modified version, right? So first of all, there's less on the slide. It's less noisy, it's less material there. There is still a couple sentences, but notice that I've kind of, if you go back to this slide, I actually don't know what the point of the slide is because I'd have to read through all of this and interpret it, right? The title says background challenge, but what does that mean? And now I gotta read everything or I gotta listen to figure it out. Here, the point of the slide is our target is obscured by a bright quasar. Very clear and to the point. Maybe the words don't all make sense, but there's a very clear statement here. And what I can do is then refer to this image. Notice I got rid of all the extra junk down here. And instead of having all the measurements in the text, I've actually imposed them directly onto the image. All right, so I've got my background quasar, that's its flux level. I've got the separation between the quasar and where my source is. Those are both clearly labeled. And I've also labeled the distance between them. So all that information used to be in the text on the side, and now it's exactly where you want to find it, right? Next to the source or next to the arrow that separates out the distances. And so I'm reduced to just kind of two very simple statements, which I can state or I can kind of summarize. I could say, I've got this really bright quasar, um, and it's so bright that in fact, there's a lot more noise in the image here, and that blocks out any signal from my source. And because of that, we're gonna propose for new observations. That took me about a minute to say, actually less than a minute, right? So I've simplified the slide, but I've still gotten the main points across. There's some stuff in there I didn't talk about from the last slide. I didn't talk about the two failed MLA, BLA programs. Um, I didn't describe this kind of curious question, which seems to come out of nowhere. I didn't give a date, right? All of this stuff is actually extraneous detail and not necessary for the general audience. Here, I've just focused on the key points. Now, I should say that the last slide is what I actually gave in a talk. And of course, it was a talk to experts so that they would understand more of these details. But this slide is just as good. And if I wanted, if someone wanted the details, I could say, that we're gonna be using the one to two gigahertz band. Uh, this is uh, in the L band. We're gonna be getting you know, three gigabytes of data from it. Like I can give all that detailed information without having it having to be read on the slide. So you can provide all that detail without writing it down. You just speak it. Um, and again, you can just tune it depending on which audience you're looking at. Any questions on that? Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's go on to uh, one more step here. We're talking about the color scheme. So the other thing that we have talked about is really kind of the design of the slide. And again, I point out that I generally use a pretty simple design, just white backgrounds, very simple like that. And part of that is because I'm trying to reduce the visual noise. Now, you may have your own design style and I've seen people make just gorgeous background slides that have beautiful structure and everything like that. And I've seen the opposite. So part of you know, your process is building yourself as a, as a presenter is to find your personal style in terms of presentations, what kind of color schemes you like, what kind of backgrounds you like. And that's really a personal choice. But there are some principles that are important sort of following as you're thinking about that choice. 
So the best way to do this is kind of look at some bad examples, some of which come from my own work. Um, oh, actually, before I go back, so Jamon asked, would it be okay to spread out the same topic to multiple slides? Or would that be asking too much from someone's attention span if it's important for the digest? So that's actually the key question, Jamon. If, it, if, if I go back to this slide, if all of this information is important, then a better way to organize this is to separate it off into two or three slides. There's actually a lot of main points here, right? So some of them are more important than others. And the problem is that, again, the person looking at the slide doesn't know what the key point to take home from this. But it could be if I've got two main points, I could separate it off into two slides that each have a main point. And again, having the main point in the title makes it very clear that this is what this slide is about. And this is what you should know as a result from this slide. Making it very, very easy that the audience knows what they're supposed to know is very useful for our presentations. So titles that state something clearly, state the result is important. And answer Javon's question, if there's two points you wanna make, make two slides. Okay. All right, so let's talk about color schemes. So here's the kind of slide I see all the time in my classes, right? It's an astronomy class. And, oh, astronomy is so beautiful. So we want to use a beautiful background to show our slides. And here's the problem, right? It is a beautiful picture. And the problem is it's kind of all I see, all right? Um, you know, the, the text that I've chosen here, which is the default text color for Google Slides, is really hard to read. In fact, at some points, I can't even make out the words at all. Um, you know, the text is a little bit too small. And then in order to like, you know, show this beautiful picture, my actual information, which is this plot is too small for folks to read, right? They can't read the axes, they can't read any of this text in here. And so you're sacrificing the important stuff, which is the science for trying to make it look pretty, all right? And so if you wanna show a pretty slide, then just show that background image and that's it, right? Don't convolute it with the science key result you want to show. Now, a lot of, for brown dwarf science, we don't usually have a lot of pretty pictures because all our sources are point sources. But if you're studying a brown dwarf and a goblet cluster or something like that, you know, I might introduce the topic by just showing a beautiful image of that globular cluster. And that's it, all right? And then I'll move on to the science. But when you start to try to merge these together, it's again, very hard for the person either to see visually what's going on or to separate out the background noise from the foreground science, right? So you definitely wanna make sure that you're keeping it simple and focusing on the goal of that slide. And by the way, showing a pretty picture to engage the audience is a perfectly acceptable thing to do, but that should be the point of that one slide. And then you move on to the science, right? Um, here's another example. <laughs> like, I want a slide that captures the visual, so I'm going to use a nice bright primary color like blue. Now, first of all, there's clearly, a, you know, some difficulty in reading black text on a bright blue background. That just happens to be how our eyes work. The other thing is, if you're staring at this for a while, it's actually kind of tiring. Um, primary colors are vivid; they really stimulate our eyes. But if you stimulate them a lot, then you're just going to get tired, right? You're going to make your audience fall asleep. Um, and again, it's a form of visual noise because we're so focused on this bright background that we can't even read or even focus on the text or the figure that's in front of there. Right? Now, this text I set off as an opposite color. But here's the problem. This is a color red. And I'm actually curious if anyone does not see the text that's here at the bottom. Okay, because one of the reasons I chose that color is that red is actually a really challenging color. And, it is, and this is actually red, it looks pink, but it's actually red in the slides, um, is because of color blindness. So here's another test for everyone. Um, just to yourself, there are three numbers here and can you see all three numbers in these patterns? Now, give you a moment to do so, and then I'll give you the answer. Yeah, Adriana. Yeah, but in the middle, there's hard to decide. Yeah. 
which one is it? Yeah, so I see a lot of check marks. That's good. Uh, and if you can't, that's fine, because you know something like 10 or 15% of the population, at least in the US, that's the number I know, um, has some degree of colorblindness. And it's actually, there's different kinds of colorblindness, different kinds of colors that we can or cannot separate. Um, and in fact, I know at least three of my colleagues in astronomy who are ironically infrared scientists, but cannot see red because of their colorblindness. I mean, they're infrared, so that's kind of beyond the red color. Um, but you know, they can't see red text, they can't see red figures, they can't see red lines in a plot. And it's so there are always there's these default colors that our you know Google or PowerPoint has for presenting things or maybe in Python has some default colors. And in some cases, those are not actually colorblind friendly. Now, even though maybe only a 10th of your audience could be colorblind, if you're giving a big talk, like say to a 300 student classroom, that means 300 students can't actually see what you're talking about. So it's important to be mindful of your color schemes and to use colorblind friendly uh, color schemes. Uh, and there's a link down here and, and that you can see that in the slides if you want to follow it um, to to find some palettes that are, are useful for colorblind folks. And I know that, you know, at least PowerPoint has built in colorblind palettes um, and Python have, for that Seaborn package that I think um, Christian may have gone over at one point um, that has a colorblind color palette. Um, so wherever you can, if you can find those palettes, it's useful to use those. Uh, because then it's easier to see uh, what we see. And I'll tell you, the splat defaults are not colorblind friendly. So that's actually a problem that we've got to fix, right? But that's, again, part of the considerations as you're thinking about how to design your plots is to think about, can everybody actually see what I'm showing here? Or is it too noisy or is it the wrong colors? So people are actually missing what we're trying to talk about. All right. Next, a very important thing that happens very often when giving presentation, this is actually, this is in design, but this is also in the practice of actually giving your presentation, is if you have a, a, a plot, you know, like a, a plot of spectrum or a plot of data points, or you're comparing, say, a color versus a color, you want to take the time to actually explain what the audience is seeing and what they should draw from that. So let me uh, show example. Again, this is a, a figure that I had from a previous presentation. And the fast way I might do this is say, so we fit some spectral data to some models. You can see in the upper right that we have a really good fit to the data. And the bottom left shows the distribution of our variables. And we end up getting pretty realistic physical parameters. Now, what's the problem with what I just did? Rocco. I know for starters, uh, it's difficult to read the axes, so you don't really know like what it is, what the data actually is, essentially. Good. Yep, and Jaman says you showed the graphs without explaining them. Very small print. Carlos also agrees, very small print. So as I was going through that, did you fully understand what you know did you did you understand how i came to the conclusions that i came to or did you have to just take my word for it hello anyone there okay yes we have here <laughs> Okay. You have to get, I am thinking. <laughs> right. So, so there's a couple problems with this. One is that I didn't explain what the graphs are. So, you know, if this is the first time that you've seen a spectrum, right, then how do you know what I just said is that we've got a good fit to spectrum? Because I don't even know which of these squiggles is the spectrum, right? Um, and then you know I pointed to this lower plot, but I didn't explain anything at all about what the, the shapes of this is, what those distributions mean, nothing. There was no explanation to tie the patterns that come from this plot to the conclusions that we're getting good uh, constraints on the physical parameters. So here's another way I can do this. Actually, there's two things I need to do first. One is 
this should be two slides, right? Part of the reason it's so hard to see the words is that I've tried to squish this down, these two plots into one slide, because, you know, maybe I just want to, you know, get through this part and get on to the next thing. But if I really want to show both of these figures, if they're really that important, then because of the size of these, I should probably switch this to two slides so I can kind of emphasize both points. Can't do that right now, but let's go through. So what I could do first is say, you know, I, this slide kind of demonstrates the uh, fits that we, the model fits that we did to our spectral data. So starting in the upper right plot, so I'm directing the gaze, what I'm plotting is the spectral flux on the y-axis versus either the pixels on the detector on the lower x-axis and what wavelength those pixels correspond to on the upper x-axis. So I'm naming my axis, right? Even though there's a, there's a label there. And in this figure, there's a few lines that are shown. The black line, which is a little hard to see, is the actual data. The reason that line is so hard to see is that our model, which is a combination of the red line, which is the original spectral atmosphere model, combined with the absorption from our atmosphere, which is the green line here, that green line is what we're really fitting to our data. And it's a tremendously good fit. You could barely see the black line behind that green line. And for comparison on the bottom here is the difference between the model and the data. And you can see it's very close to zero, very few residuals. And all those residuals are consistent with the uncertainty in the spectral measurements. Now, I took quite a while to describe that, but hopefully now it's a lot clearer on how I can say that we have a good fit to the data because I've explicitly pointed out the key features, the key patterns that justify that. In particular, the fact that the difference between the model and the data is this very small squiggly line that's consistent with the uncertainties. Adriana, that's a good suggestion. You can also, if you have more than one slide, you can either put a number or a letter and say, I'm gonna start with figure A and describe that. And then we're gonna to move to figure B. Right? So you're giving guidance to the observers, the person who's watching so they know what they should be looking at as you're describing it. Now, Charlie has a question here. Um, uh, presentation file that could work as a reference. Oh, okay. I think we'll get to that. Uh, I can answer that at the end. Okay. Um, all right. So that would be at least describing that first plot. And again, the key here is you want to make sure you describe each of the axes. You describe what all of the data points or the lines they correspond to. And in fact, what I could do have done better is actually to have a little legend to say, you know, the black line is our data. The red line is our atmosphere model. The green line is atmosphere plus to lurk, right? Have that color coded clearly so that you don't have to wait for me to say it. You can kind of look it up. So a little bit more labeling on this plot would have helped as well. Um, and, you know, highlighting, maybe even like putting a yellow band down here to highlight and say, this is the part you should look at to prove that this is a really good fit because the uncertainties are very, very small. Okay. Questions on that? Again, every plot you show, you should follow the same pattern. Axes, what are the lines, what are the patterns, and what does it mean? Right? So, Red color, I, I think, should be should be emulated, right? Don't you yes. Not exactly. Allowed. Good, Adriana. Good catch. Actually, you're absolutely right. Yes. In this case, the other thing that could make this better is that red line is probably either not visible or hard to see for other people. Honestly, the green line is also a little hard to see because it's kind of a bright green on a white background. So. I should also go back and rethink how I plot these, 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 make these figures. And, and I should say, actually, you know, again, I made this maybe seven, five, seven years ago. Um, and Dino's doing more of this work now, and he's really gone through and re reformatted all the plots so that they are more readable for, you know, a wide range of people. Yeah, but good catch, Adriana, thinking about the colors. Excellent. Thank you. But not, I, I think, well, these these graphs 
these plots are, um, I think it's not as terrible, <laughs> but when we use letters to, to explain the figures or the thing, the, the topic, the red one that you show us before, like a, is like a bright, no, the, the one before, yes, that one. Uh, no, the, that one? No, no, the red one. Let me see. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. That one? No. No. That no. One? <laughs> Even if we change the test color, it may be on the red on the next one. I think so. No. No. I, I you mean this one? I lost it. No. The, the one before? Yes, that okay. one. It, it is a red, like it's uh, uh, awful red. <laughs> there are another, um, another matisse that can be good, but the preference, I don't allow <laughs> red one. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's, there are colors that are close to red that are uh, colorblind friendly. There's magenta is a mixture of red and blue, and that turns out to be kind of cross the border enough that people can differentiate it. You know, in this case, it's really hard. We, you know, for those of us who are not colorblind, the red does at least stand out from the blue, but both colors are just really hard on the eyes. So this is the case of you have to really think, is this the background you want? Or is there a simpler or more, um, you know, often backgrounds, you know, again, because they're in the background, right? They're not the main focus of your talk. So they should be subdued, you know? So you know, palettes that are kind of, you know, um, trying to think like, uh, you know, just very, very subdued colors. And by the way, they could be black. Black is a perfectly acceptable background, um, but you wanna make sure it's, you know, not standing out and obscuring your information, right? This is a case where the background totally dominates the visual noise from the slide. And I just can't read <laughs> or really focus on anything else. Um, you could have a background like this, by the way, but just reduce the contrast. So it becomes much more sort of subdued. And that way you have kind of the prettiness behind it, but you've reduced the kind of contrasty noise. So there are games you can play with this to still have a pretty background, but make it very subdued. And that's the key thing. Your background should not dominate what people see. In fact, that's why I use no background because I don't want any confusion of what the main focus of my talk is. All right, let me uh, get to this last part. So. The last thing here, of course, is actually we've talked about is keeping the presentation short, all right? And my rule of thumb is less than one slide per minute. So if you're doing a 10 minute talk, that should be like eight slides or less. Some people use two minutes per slide if they feel they're gonna be talking through slides more frequently, um, or sorry, taking more time to talk through the slides. So you really wanna gauge it by how complex your slides is, how much information you have, and the thing you should be doing is actually reducing the amount of information as opposed to trying to pack it into fewer slides. If you feel you have to pack in a lot of information to make this one slide per minute cut, you're not actually saving yourself any time. What you're gonna do is you're not gonna explain everything on the slide. So the hard part of all this is deciding what to throw out and focus just on the key points. All right, any, and, and if you have, and by the way, if you have any additional points, one nice trick is to add some slides after the end of your presentation for that Q&A period or just for reference. So when you look at my slides, what you'll find is that there's a slide at the end, which is tips on designing an effective presentation, but there's a lot more tips here, right? So instead of having to like spend the next hour going through more tips, what I've done is I've decided to narrow it down to the ones I think are most important and then leave you with additional tips that you can go over on your own. All right, and that's a slide that's at the end. So as you're editing down your slides, you might say, well, I'm not sure if I wanna keep in this confusion matrix or not. Well, what you can do is you can just add it to the end, you know, at the very back of the slide deck. And then if someone asks you during Q and A, well, did you look at your confusion matrix? You could say, oh, yes, I did. <laughs> Here's the slide. Right? So this is one way of also anticipating what questions you might get. So if you know that there's additional plots that are important for your analysis or additional sort of details in your methodology, 
or other results that you think people would be interested in, you, do, you could just add those to the back end and save them for the question and answer period or save them for reference for people who are gonna look at your slides later. Okay. All right, any questions at this point? Um, Cause I think I'm gonna take like a short break here cause this is kind of a natural breaking point. Uh, but uh, is there any questions uh, before we go on to the second part? No from Adriana. Uh, okay, so Carlos is asking uh, if we can record the team's presentation. Um, so that's a question for the Amasi group. I don't know if they're already recording. Um, I would say if you want to record just your team's presentation, um, I think it's probably fine just to ask your other teammates if that's okay to do. Um, but I don't know if, I, I mean, I assume in Lossy is recording these, but I don't know because we haven't got any information. Um, but I think if you just ask your own teammates and as long as you just record your team's presentation, I don't see a problem with it. All right, so you got at least one team member, that's okay. Um, <laughs> so, and then Charlie asked earlier, uh, is Charlie, are you still here? No, okay. Um, okay, so uh, let's take a break then. Let's take a five minute break. Um, we'll convene back at 3.17, my local time. Um, and we'll pick up from there and talk a little bit about the presentation part of the presentation. And then we'll take a look at some examples uh, and do a little um, uh, research into the kind of presentations that we see out there. So we're gonna do a five minute break here. I'm gonna pause the recording. So we've just gone through some, some, not all, but some of the kind of uh, key tips that, again, from my experience from presentations, from, you know, developing my own style by seeing students develop their styles, kind of the key things that go through. And there's a lot more there that's in the end of the presentation. Um, and I want to transition to another topic, um, which is actually giving the presentation. Uh, and then we're going to do uh, a, uh, a kind of uh, investigation into a few presentations and see if we can see how these actually play out. Um, but before we dive into this, I just wanna see if anyone had any questions that emerged from that five minute break that they wanted to bring up. Okay. All right, so uh, we're gonna now talk about the actual presentation itself. And this is just gonna be a few uh, quick bullet points about what are the things you should be doing as you're giving your presentation. Um, and so, you know, all of the stuff we talk about is kind of how you develop, you think about it ahead of time, those three questions to start with, then how do we actually design the slides, in terms of color, in terms of content, stuff like that. But of course, then you wanna give the presentation. Um, and so it's important to kind of think about some of the key things to do when you're giving presentation. Um, and one of those is just, you know, be serious about the presentation, no matter what it is, and even in this virtual environment. So this is the, you know, dress to success, right? So how you dress is, of course, up to you, um, but you do want to come, you know, present yourself as professional. Um, right now, I'm just wearing a t-shirt, so it's not particularly professional, but this is kind of more of an educational setting. But if I was giving a, say, a talk at a uh, you know, uh, if, you know, university, let's say I was giving a talk at UC Santa Cruz, I certainly would not go to the talk in my t-shirt, right? I would dress up with a shirt and a tie. Um, you know, I would, I would really present myself as professional because this is part of your professional work is showing yourself that you are, a, you know, someone who's going to take this seriously. Um, and that includes also in virtual presentations, which I think we're going to be doing for a little bit longer because of the pandemic. Um, so even these virtual presentations, you want to think about how do you present yourself in a way that is, you know, professional and clear. Um, and part of that is also like how you speak, right? So when you speak, speaking clearly and slowly, and I should say, this is one of the areas that I need to work on more than anything. I'm sure some of you know that I speak quite quickly <laughs> um, when I'm giving a talk. And so I definitely have uh, this area is something I work on quite a bit. Um, but there's also uh, how you speak is also in terms of your modulation. So if you'll notice that I tend to, you know, when I speak in a presentation mode, 
I tend to be very active and engaged and I try to speak up as much as I can. And then once in a while, I'll take a break. And this is, you know, finding your pauses in your presentation is actually a very powerful uh, trick. So let me go back to a couple slides back here. Um, uh, let's go to this one, okay? Now I can describe the slide and, and you know, there's a couple ways I can do it that really wouldn't be very effective. So if I say, so we took some radio data and we got the image to the left and uh, this is at 1.4 gigahertz and then that's about quasars with 28 series keys. And I mean, you can barely hear me. <laughs> and I'm also not very excited. And of course you wanna convey excitement to other folks as well. So you don't have to be, you know, crazy mad and scientist and like, oh, that's so and stuff like that. But you do wanna make sure you're speaking up and speaking clearly and talking about your research in a way that is, this is a very interesting result and you should be interested in as well. So here's this image that we captured with the VLA, the Very Large Array Telescope. Uh, this is the first image that we've been able to capture of this field. And as it turns out, there's this bright quasar right in the middle of it, all right? So that's a little bit more engaging. And obviously your personal style will vary depending on what your comfortableness with public speaking is and you know, what your comfortableness in speaking online is versus speaking in person. But you do wanna make sure you're engaging the audience. Now, the other thing I want you to notice is right now, I am the only one in the video and that's okay. I didn't ask everyone to be on the video, um, but it's also important that being the speaker, I am on the video. And for the most part, I'm keeping an eye on the camera. So my slides are actually over here and you see that occasionally I'll go back and refer to them, but I try to keep my focus on my audience. And again, it's a little weird because of virtual world, but my audience, of course, is through the camera lens. So I try to make sure that I keep my attention on you as opposed to on my slides. And when we get back to in-person presentations, this is another area that we see often either new presenters or even shy presenters have problems with. It's very easy to, I'm gonna avoid the crowd by just staring at my slides. And that way I don't see people are looking at me when they don't get nervous, all right? And I should say this, this is part of that nervousness and getting used to, to speaking in front of public audiences is just part of the practice. Um, and it's gonna be awkward for some of you uh, right, right off the bat. Some of you are gonna be perfectly fine with it, right? But my experience is that that first time you're giving talks, it's very nerve wracking, particularly when we transition back to live presentation, that's gonna be even more nerve wracking because we're not used to having people around us. Um, and so you want to make sure, first of all, you practice with that situation, but you do make sure that you speak to the audience and not to your presentation. So if you need to make a point, all right, so in this case, it's easy on mine because I can just wiggle my mouse and say, look here at the source, all right? Um, or if I was presenting in live, I could either point to it or I could use my laser pointer. But you want to do that briefly and then return the attention back to your audience. So make sure you're always engaging your audience. The other thing about modulating the voice is I mentioned these pauses. So let's say I'm gonna take a look at this and say, All right, here's, the, uh, here's our first detection, or this is our first image that we took of our field. And what you see here in the middle is this really bright source. Is this the object? Turns out it's not, it's actually background quasar. So notice I did some pauses there. Right. And part of the pause is, is to, you know, break up the flow, but it also, you know, kind of encourages you to say, oh, wait, there's something I need to think about here because the <laughs> presenter or the professor has stopped talking. All right. And so there's a moment where I have to actually, oh, I have to pay attention. There's something important. Pauses really kind of allow you to set off important things. Here's another example, right? If I go back to my key takeaway point, all right. One of the things I can do is I can read this off. Scientific presentation should be brief, focused, and targeted to your specified or specific audience. Pause, right? Pauses allow us to communicate that something important has been said or something important is about to be said. So don't feel that you got to talk through your entire talk in one go, right? Again, nervousness may encourage you to do so. But if you can make use of these changes in modulation, changes in pace, using pauses so that people pay attention to the next point, right? 
that's a very useful uh, oratory trick. Um, so, you know, think about how you can vary things up a little bit. Uh, let's see, let's go to our next point here. Um, another thing that I often will see in particularly new speakers, but also even senior speakers, um, there's kind of a false humility that will come across. So you might say, here's our results. You know, they're not what we expected. We had some issues, but this is kind of the best we could do. And it's not entirely finished yet. We're still working on the details. All of that is diminishing the results. Every time there's gonna be a case where there's more to be done or the study is incomplete. But you should be specifically pointing out those aspects as opposed to hedging on your result. So if you spend a lot of time saying that this is not good work, your audience will believe you. <laughs> so and you don't want that. So you wanna make sure that you know, every project is gonna have you know, areas where it can be improved. And that's something you talk about at the end of your work. Or if it's very specific to this technique, you might say, because of the computational complexity of this, you know, the simulation, we had to make some simplifying assumptions, right? That's a very proactive way of saying, we had to kind of dumb it down a little bit because we weren't quite sure how to like do all the different modeling things, right? One is we thought proactively about this. One is I'm diminishing the work. So just be careful as you're presenting that you're presenting your work in the best light. It's your work. So if you're not gonna present it in the best light, no one else is. So make sure that you're taking the time to do that. On the flip side, don't overblow your work, right? So if you say, you know, we fit this random forest to this uh, data set, and now we know how to find every ultra cool dwarf in the galaxy. That is not a conclusion that's supported by the evidence, right? So make sure that when you are, you know, presenting particularly the implications of your work or the results, that you're putting them in the proper context, right? No one's going to believe if you diminish your work, they're also not going to believe if you over-exaggerate your work. So make sure your conclusions and your implications are clear and they follow logically from the work you've just presented. Um, I mentioned virtual presentations, making sure to look in the audience. Um, and then, you know, one of the most important things that is depending on the format of the presentation and, you know, we have a presentation coming up for a symposium and I don't know how that's going to be structured, but knowing that it's 10 minutes per talk, um, I suspect that you're not going to be introduced at the beginning. You're just going to be introduced as here's team seven. Um, so if no one has introduced you, make sure you at least state your name at the beginning of your talk. This seems like a real simple thing, but uh, I've been to many talks where someone will just dive right in and I don't even know who's speaking. <laughs> so, you know, make sure you do that. And one thing you can also do is if you want to remind people about who's giving the presentation, you could put a little footnote here with your name on it or, you know, and Lassie team eight, who is so-and-so and so-and-so, right? Um, it's okay to use the footnote to just remind people that you're the one giving this talk. And therefore, if they have any questions or if they want to follow up, you're the person to reach out to. Right. One of the important things about all presentations is that it's an opportunity to kind of share the work and to allow it to grow. And we give talks to audiences so that they can get interested in the work we're doing. But if you don't tell them how to get a hold of you, then it's harder to do so. So you may want to either, you know, make sure your name's on the title slide, put your name on the footnote, uh, on the footer for the slides. And at the end of the presentation, you may want to have a, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me by this email by this Twitter handle, by this Instagram account, whatever you want to do. Um, but you want to make sure that people can get in touch, in touch with you. All right, any other questions about giving presentations? Well, I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, according to the, well, we are in the virtual, virtual mode, but I, I'm curious, how, how do you prefer the visual camera on, camera off? Because this is our, well, on, on this, uh, this year, this summer, but um, it is easy to turn off the, the camera for my side, but um, what it's better for you? What is, what do you prefer? <laughs> So, so let me just be clear that, that instructions really, when I'm talking about presentations, if you're giving the presentation, your camera should always be on. Right. Um, 
And, you know, if there's some reason it can't be on because of technical reasons, um, you should explain that at the beginning and, uh, you know, apologize for that the case and at least have a headshot of yourself up there. So, you know, several of you have headshots. Juan Diego somehow looks like a dog. Um, and so does Ebar. Oh, a dog's in these pictures, All right? Some of you just have letters right now. So, it, you know, you can change that to a per picture of yourself if there's some technical reason you're unable to show yourself in the presentation. If there's no technical reason, um, you should be showing yourself. And you might do things like right now I have Zoom set so it blurs the background. I could also just put something behind me where I kind of block out my personal space. I mean, this is the hard part about Zoom presentations is that suddenly people are in your space. So it's good to kind of set yourself up so maybe the wall is behind you so you don't see the rest of the visual noise. Um, you can set up, of course, a different background. Um, but, you know, if you're giving the presentation, you should be visible because it's your presentation. Um, now, in terms of participating in these sessions, um, you know, so Adriana, you're a teacher. Um, I know that you've, you know, you remember the good old days where we would be in the classroom and you could see the audience and you could tell, oh, this person's not getting it or this group is kind of confused, so I better go back over that again. Or there's like, someone's really interested and ask, wants to ask a question, but is not raising their hand, so maybe I'll take a break and pause because I know a question is coming, right? It's part of reading the audience is a very important part of, of giving presentations. And again, it comes from practice. In a room like this where nobody has their cameras on and nobody responds to my text, I have no idea if you got it or not. So as an audience member, it's, uh, I would say a, a nice thing to keep your camera on so that the speaker can engage with you. But I also know that that may be difficult in, you know, particularly for large presentations, most people will have their cameras off because it's, you know, a large presentation. Does that, does that answer your question, Adriana? Yes, yes, definitely. But, well, uh, well um, on, this, on this conversation, especially, I think most of us are very interested in and we are working totally completely the the point in the well, i'm going to put my camera <laughs> the point in the, the in the class are the many many students maybe doesn't want to be there and that's another another issue but i can tell that on this on this summer most of us want to be here and want to listen anything everything I don't yeah. want to miss anything. <laughs> and let me be clear, I, I also assume that. And I, so, you know, the turning on and off the cameras is a really, I mean, this is a really, if I was a sociologist, this would be one of the things I would write a thesis on, right? Like who and when and why do people turn on their cameras? I, you know, I'm taking a class right now in uh, a business class uh, over the summer and I don't turn on my camera for the class unless we're doing an interactive session. Um, so, you know, so there, yeah, there's a whole, and because there's like 180 people in the class, right? So like they don't see me anyways. Um, but this is, you know, again, so I think we're getting, we're getting a little off topic here, but I think it's actually kind of an interesting discussion to have about the virtual, you know, presentation style. The, the thing you have control over is you showing yourself when you give a presentation. So you don't have control of whether people are turning their cameras. There may be technical reasons why they can't do that. They may be in places where they can't show their background, their computer is not fast enough. So I'm very like lenient on whether or not folks show their cameras. Um, but when you're presenting, you should, you know, as again, unless there's a technical reason you cannot, you should be on screen and looking out at the audience, even if they're not looking back at you, uh, because that's how we at least engage with our material. Okay, thanks. Okay, all right. Um, and by the way, I, so I don't have this on the slides, but I'll, also one more point, a part of the engagement, you know, there's also the Q&A session. So we're doing a Q&A session right now, right? I ask if there's any questions. And a, a nice practice to get in the habit of, and I'll try to make sure I put this in the slides, uh, the final version of the slides. Um, when you get a question, it's good to repeat the question. Um, and particularly, this is when you're in a live audience, it's very important to do so. But part of that is to make sure you've understood the question. Um, and I don't think I've actually, I don't think I've done this in this session, but it's something that I try to do, particularly in live audiences, because, you know, you might hear the question, but other people may not. 
or you may want to clarify the question by repeating it back. Um, and then the other thing you notice I always do is at the end I said, you know, does that answer your question? But I don't just leave it off. Right, next question, right? I just check in to make sure that I understood the question and I asked, I answered the question that you had in mind. Um, and that's again a very good practice to make sure that you're, you know, really engaging with the audience and the questions that are coming up there. Okay. All right. Any other questions? <laughs> Okay, so let's take, we're going to do another uh, interactive thing here. Um, we're going to, oh, and that's my thing, most important tip when you're presenting is to practice, right? Not, not once, not just before the presentation, but go through your slides multiple times, all right? And, um, you know, one thing that we can do nowadays is we can also record ourselves giving our presentations. And, you know, you might be horrified to see yourself giving a presentation, but it's a very educational experience and you can see yourself going too fast or skipping over things or perhaps not explaining everything on the slide. So, you know, take the, you know, the opportunity that we have for this technology to kind of, you know, feedback on it and, and look at how we're presenting and do those practices. And, you know, I, you know, I typically, you know, obviously I've been giving a lot of talks and so I don't practice as much as I probably did at the beginning, but when I was first starting to give science presentations, my advisor said, sit down and give your presentation five times before you give it to an audience, five times. And you know, if you're giving an hour long talk, that means five hours of practice. Um, but it's important because uh, that's how you make sure that you're on time. That's how you make sure that your transitions make sense that you're communicating well with your audience and you're getting your points across. And, you know, you could do it with a friend. Um, you can present to your friends. You can present to yourself and record it. Um, it's up to you, but you do want to make sure you practice a few times before you actually give your talk. All right. Now, fortunately for the Mossy folks, you only got a 10 minute talk. So if you do it five times, it's only an hour, but I would definitely make sure you commit that time to try to practice a talk at least a few times before Friday. Okay, any other questions? All right, so let's do uh, a little bit interactive. We're gonna break out into breakout rooms for this one. Um, and what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be looking at presentations from the Cool Stars 20.5 conference. It's 20 and a half because it was a virtual conference between the 20th and the 21st conference. Um, there are five presentations that have been uh, displayed up on this website uh, here, and I will make sure to get the link in there. Um, and I'm breaking up at you into five rooms. So let me just let me just get this uh, set up here real quick. Uh, da -da -da. Okay, so sorry. Let me bring up the slides again so I can explain this as I'm talking. Um, okay, so you're gonna go to the Zenota site. I'm gonna break you up into five rooms and each room has a presentation that's linked to it. So room one is this John Core et al. Room two is Brig Allegale. Um, you can see what these links look like. I go to the website. Um, this is a compilation of those presentations. So you can see the five that are there. All right, so each room is gonna take one of these that they're assigned. You're gonna spend about 10, 15 minutes, let's say 15 minutes. You're gonna look through the slide deck. Obviously we're not doing a live presentation for those, you're just looking at their slides, looking at the design of their slides. And then you're gonna to go to this Google Doc and I'll put the link for all these up in the, um, in the chat window. You're gonna to go to this Google Doc and for each of your for your presentation that you've looked at, you're gonna list three things that they did well based on some of the tips and guidelines that I've given in the last you know, uh, hour and a half. And then three things that you think they can improve upon. And it could be things that you're catching that are different than what we've talked about, right? So maybe it's something where, well, it doesn't look like they really explained at this point, or I can't tell what the axes are based on the figure, something like that. So you're gonna think of three things as a group that they did well, three things that you think they can improve. And then we're gonna collect back again in 15 minutes and kind of quickly go through those. 
So let me put in the chat window uh, all the relevant links here. Just a few. There's my chat window. There we go. All right. And I'm going to go ahead and break you out into breakout rooms now. All right. And again, we'll be coming back together in 15, well, actually we'll do it 12 minutes since we're running close to time, so 12 minutes. Um, and uh, here we go. So just keep track of your room number when you go to your breakout room and then follow the link for that particular room. Okay, I think everyone's back out. So um, first of all, how did, how did that go? Did folks see things they like and things they didn't like? We need more time. <laughs> you need more time. Okay. Well, yeah. Well, unfortunately, we have. I mean, we have the time we got, but this is this is meant to be a start, and I, hopefully, it's starting to get used to some of the tools that we see to look whether things are are good or or uh, need improvement presentations. Why don't we take a moment and just have uh, each uh, team take maybe two minutes to point out maybe uh, one or two of the things they liked and things they didn't like uh, from their presentation. So I want to start with room one. So can someone from room one kind of share a couple of things? And what I'll do is I'm going to bring up the slides from that presentation so folks can see them because we didn't all see the same slides. Um, so can someone from room one uh, lead us through a couple of their main points? Yes. So first, we I said that well, we said that um, they provide like the goal of their project in slide two. Mm -hmm. Bottom left. Yeah. Right there, this goal and like I guess that's like the goal of their project. So we thought they did that well. Um, they also have really good graphics and like just their visuals are detailed and colored and everything. So I. I said that that was like a good thing. Like they have a lot of like great ways to visualize their information. I think Gabar said that they have good organization with an outline. Um, so right here, yeah. Yeah. So what I said that they could improve on to was that they have a lot of information in all of their slides, like starting from slide two to eight, they're basically all kind of packed. So it seems like right there, they're trying to include like two slides in one. Yeah, and literally they put kind of a divider between them to kind of make, <laughs> make, to make two slides yeah. in one space, yeah. Yeah, and it's just hard to follow and, and to read because it's like you're trying to like look at both sides kind of. Um, Okay, and they also do not provide a definition for why is so, because it seems like that's like the main thing that they're talking about is why is so, but I couldn't find a definition and I asked my teammates and they couldn't find one either and I think that that was like a really big problem. Yeah, it's in, so you know, just to keep in mind that this talk would have been in a conference where people probably know what YSO stands for, however you know, they use that acronym YSO. And that's actually one of the things I have in the design things is when you have acronyms or jargon, you know, particularly with a mixed audience, you do want to make sure you define them. So YSO stands for young stellar objects, but you're right. I see nowhere that they actually stay young stellar object and then parentheses YSO, they don't define it. So even in an expert community, uh, experts may have different, you know, names for things and different acronyms. So even in this community, it would have been good for them to at least say what a YSO is, as opposed to just using that phrase throughout. Yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah, and you know, the good thing, so th this group is looking at um, dust images, so you do get these pretty pictures, but there is a lot of text on some of these slides, very hard to parse all this information. So when you're reading this, you certainly wouldn't be reading all of that information. So now there's a competition between does the reader the, the viewer, do they read the slide or do they listen to you? And you don't want to put the viewer in that position. So they could certainly reduce the amount of text they have in here. All right, great. Uh, let's go to room two, uh, who had the Bregalia, Bregaglia, I think. Bregaglia, possibly. Can um, I get some room two? Yep. Yes, I can go. So um, one of the things that we thought they could improve on was that on slide six, 
the background um, made things very difficult to see. And I believe, I don't remember if it was Carlos or Ibar that had pointed this out, but I thought that was a really good observation because it's, I actually looked at this um, graph recently and it's a really cool graph, but the combination of these two information just makes both of them so much more difficult to understand. Exactly right, yeah, I agree. Um, so that was one of the things that they could improve on. Um, one of the good things that they did was that on the majority of the slides, I don't think it was on this one, but they had a footnote on the bottom to remind us of the main topic and changes with the subtopic. So yeah, so there it is on that one. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so it looks like they're referring to the paper in which this result comes from. So that's a, that is a good contextual piece that if you wanna learn more about this, this is the paper you wanna look at. So that's a good use of the footnote. Um, they also had mostly images and not a whole lot of text, but sometimes the slides were a little bit cluttered and they had like, the words were a little bit on the small side, like um, nine and 14, I think were good ones to look There's at. Nine. Yeah, so it- There's 14. Yeah, so it's just kind of hard to read exactly um, which source I think it is that they're referencing, the Gulliver and all that. So it was just a little bit on the small side. Could maybe like split it up, but I understand that it's also the same topic. And then we weren't sure exactly whether the work in progress sign was a good thing or not, because I think it also depends on how they present it and how they state that it is a work in progress or, yeah. Yeah, and you know, it, the interesting thing to me is that, you know, I think these are meant to be their main slide or the main graphics, but the thing that sticks out to me immediately is the work in progress figure. So that becomes the most important figure on the slide. And then you have to ask, is that really supposed to be the most important figure? Um, so they could maybe shrink this down a little bit or get rid of it entirely because they say work in progress down here. Okay. Was about it for us, yeah. Great. All right, let's go to room three. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I, guess I can talk a bit about it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so uh, stuff that we thought they did uh, well on was like use as few words as possible and still wrap this line and try and like illustrate more. And um, they did that through like expanding like a particular topic or some topic so various dozen slides, and so like more spread out than once well, clustered. And um, yeah, I think that was something that I found that was uh, pretty, uh, pretty like useful or like for the to see at least. But some things that we can improve on are that uh, I believe like slide five has like a lot of details on it, but it could be like that because maybe they were transitioning through something and uh, the PDF couldn't capture it. Probably like that. But um, I don't know what else could be better. But yeah, and then the last, the very last slide seems kind of complicated. And uh, yeah, maybe we could have split up or have all the few words. It's complicated. Or maybe they even pop. So you don't know what it's up. What's it right there? But it seems kind of complicated. Just by just looking at it. Yeah. So this, you know, this is probably something very specific to this research. And, you know, to a layperson, there's just a bunch of dots. And then there's this weird curve on the, on the right side. So some labeling of, you know, this plot is for this and this plot is for this. So they may have done that verbally, but even in the slide, they could have like, you know, a word or two to say, you know, the right side is the histogram, the left side is the scatter plot or something like that, yeah. Right. Yeah, and we also saw, I guess, the last slide could have been like not the color, colorblind friendly. And so mm. uh, it could be an issue. Yeah, some people may not see the red in that one. Now, you know, the thing I noticed that I wonder, it doesn't look like they have like a final slide either that kind of summarizes everything. They kind of end on this. So when we're talking about the uh, the story arc, right? This seems like a climax, you know, this kind of results of research. And then there's no coming down, right? So this is a little bit of an incomplete presentation for that reason. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I guess that's also something. Yeah. All right, great, uh, room four. 
Well, Hi. I guess. Oh, oh you're you you going to speak? Oh, we can share. I mean, we can go. Also. Okay, you can. I, you made a really good observation there. You can do the pros and I can do the cons. Yeah, Joman, sure, yeah, you, 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 play, you play the good guy and, and Juan Diego play the bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, well, I think one thing that really stood out to me immediately was that um, in already in slide two, they had identified like three things to look out for. And, you know, by setting up these main points, it kind of like allowed the, like, me as an audience to, as is referenced during a talk, this is a in person talk, right? It'll, it has audio, there's also visual and all of that. And having these already established, it kind of allows me to reference, you know, oh, this is what I have to uh, attend to. And, you know, there's some other information here, and et cetera. And I think um, just earlier, I just also, besides what we've written down on the document, um, I like how, because it might be a pattern for me that I like things enumerated in a sense, <laughs> where later on in, I think, uh, let me see what slide is about, in, uh, at slide five, and also later when they talk about how to model the spin evolution. Yeah, they, they do so by doing steps. And I think that makes, when it comes to talking about process, by first establishing like, you know, a clear cut, you know, what one would expect from one stage to another, I think that, uh, you know, I think that makes it a lot more understandable because I, this, I realized uh, this, I think like um, in parts, they had to put um, the same step in the different slides just to not crowd them. And I think that's also a good practice not to, to not have them all on the same slide just because they have the same step. And another thing I think Adrian wrote this down or mentioned earlier was that, uh, you know, there's not too much text on each slide and also there's footnotes of the name of speaker and, and in that references to talk, uh, the data to talk and um, other relevant information. And yes, we're referring to what we just mentioned earlier. Uh, there's also an ending slide in the, in the end that also advertises the speaker that they're looking for a job, which is, <laughs> which is important. So yeah, I think there's some of the things that we've noticed when we, uh, we're looking at this uh, presentation. Yeah, so the last slide's a little wordy, but this is super cute, right? There's a kind of cartoony <laughs> picture of the speaker, and I'm looking for a job. So you can tell, by the way, you can almost infer that one of the goals for this speaker was to, to get a job, right, to get hired. So they're giving this talk so that people will learn about her research and be so impressed by it that they will, you know, give her a postdoc job. And um, so clearly you can see that that goal factors into the design of the slide, not just with the last slide here with the contact information and letting people know that we're looking for a job, but also every slide has her name on it. So it's very clear that this is her work. All right, uh, Juan Diego, do you wanna, you wanna be the, the bad guy now? Yeah, this has been like starting uh, towards the end. Mm -hmm. um, it's not such a color friendly friendly presentation. So we can notice, yeah, for example, in this slide that you're showing right now, uh, she uses a lot of green, yellow, red, and some types of color blindness. Uh, can mix a uh, green, red, and gray. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's my one of my best friends is called blind, and he explained me a little bit of it. So by using those three colors in the same slide, like in, even gray, uh, it can mix up a lot, and it may be hard to understand for for colorblind people. And also, she's using a lot of figures in the in that slide. Um, for example, uh, slides 19, I believe, 36, 37, and 38. Like, yeah. Um, it's a long presentation, so it may take it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Whoa. It's really crowded. <laughs> it's really crowded, yeah. Yeah. And well, the one that you were showing before, uh, they have a lot of images. It's crowded. And despite they look pretty, maybe it's it can be hard to do understand yeah. and yeah, yeah that was basically what we put over there yeah i'm taking but you know like i look at this middle plot with these points and then i go back and look at the slide i have on um, color blindness and um 
uh, it looks like the same color scheme. Yeah. So it's almost exactly the opposite of what you want to do for uh, for color color blindness. So yeah, so that's a good observation. All right. Last but not least, let's do uh, room room five. Okay, so I'm going to talk about what um, we talked about in room five. And um, some of the things that we think they did well was um, they chose like the color they chose. Um, it, it makes it possible to read the text clearly. Um, all the text is really clear, really clear. So that was one thing that we thought, thought was well done. And then also all their graphs are also really clear. Clear, though we, we do think they had like a lot of graphs like all over the place, but um, they were all clear. And in most of them, um, they also kind of explained some of the main aspects of the graphs and plots. And then also um, another, other, another thing was at the end, they put um, a summary of kind of like all the main points. Like all the way, the last slide was just summaries and it had summary and it has some of the main points. So we also thought that was that was well done. And then also that they highlighted um, or, or put a lot of the important words in bold. Um, I think not there, but like in some of the slides they had certain words in bold to signify that they were important in that. Like there, yeah. And then, and then any, any ways um, they can improve? Yes, we put first that um, they should have less text, especially like the first slide right off the bat. It has like a lot of text, like really long bullet points. So that was like the first thing that we noticed. Um, and then also, like I kind of mentioned before, the plots, they have like a lot of them. So maybe they should just not use so many of them and explain like, choose the ones they find the most important and um, explain those instead of having the whole page full of graphs and plots. Um, and then we also um, put that they should use like main titles, especially like also on the first slide, like it just goes right into text without like a title or anything. So that and then um, we also put that there's some text boxes that overlap like with the template lines, which makes it look a little um, disorganized in a way, but yeah. And I think that was mostly it. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah, so, you know, the, you know the, this presentation clearly had decided on a, you know, design template they wanna use. And the good thing is they're consistent with it throughout the presentation. And you're absolutely right that the text is, is pretty readable. So you don't necessarily, you don't have to have just black on white or white on black to be readable. You can have different combinations. Um, so that's fine. Um, but yeah, there are, you know, full, a lot of full sentences, a lot of slides with a lot of text. And you can imagine when they're presenting and you get to the summary, you know, as a reader, or a viewer of this, which one of these uh, six points is the most important? I don't know. Are they all important? That's a lot of information that to remember from this very short presentation. So, you know, uh, they they should narrow this down a little bit. Um, I like that you pointed out the bold text as a way of highlighting key points. Although if you think about it, the bold text stands out a little bit, but there's other things they could do. They could make the text a different color to highlight it. And you'll see that often in my slides is I'll, I'll highlight a word or a key point that's a different color. So there are ways that you can draw the attention to a specific conclusion or a key result or a key information piece using these kind of you know, textual um, annotations. Um, the better thing to do is just reduce the amount of text. That's the best, best option. But if you, know, you need to have some you know, sort of uh, information to kind of put around it, then it's often good to kind of just point the person to the key point uh, with, uh, with the bold text. All right, so uh, so that's we, we're a bit over, so I want to make sure we are mindful of your time. Um, hopefully, this was an opportunity to kind of see some of these different tactics in, in place. And of course, one thing I want to highlight is all five of those presentations were given in an international top conference for our community. So, you know, you know, you, you saw both really good stuff and not so good stuff that could be improved. And so, you don't need to strive to be perfect on your first or third or tenth presentation. 
Um, you know, part of this is to start to become aware of the things that work and don't work for presentations and to watch, right? So when you're in this symposium this Friday, um, you know, you'll be seeing lots of presentations and you'll see lots of good stuff and you'll see lots of not so good stuff. And so what I often do when I'm at these conferences is of course I'm learning about the, the you know, science that's going on, but I'm also keeping an eye on what are some good techniques for presenting the work. And if I see something, you know, you can, you can, I don't want to say steal it, but you can certainly adapt it, right? If you see someone really showing a, a clear way of putting a, a clear statement or some kind of nice simple design for the backgrounds, you know, you can, you can use that as inspiration for your own work. So I don't, I know Charlie had a question early on. I think, unfortunately, I think he's left, but Charlie had a question about where do we get resources for these? And honestly, the way I do it is I will either remember from my own conferences or I will go and look up presentations uh, from other conferences and just see what they look like. And whatever draws your attention is likely to draw the attention of your audience. So look for those things that make it really easy to understand, really clear, and you know, that's going to help you design uh, your particular slides. All right, any questions before we wrap up today? Okay. All right, so hopefully that's good inspiration both uh, for everyone who's presenting um, and uh, this will be recording will be posted up on the website uh, as well as the slides and we'll see folks on Wednesday for Inlossi's practice presentations. See you then. <laughs>